This video is a review of the Dementin Kleitman study on sleeping and rapid eye movement. This is one of the oldest studies in the Cambridge uh, A level or AS level syllabus. You can see the year there is 1957, uh, but it also should be noted that this study has been, I believe, in three iterations of the uh, AS syllabus uh, for psychology, um, which is kind of good news and bad news. Good news because um, most teachers are deeply familiar with the study, but bad news because um, you may find that some of the questions get more and more in depth as the years go on. Um, you know, my suspicion is that Cambridge sometimes runs out of things to ask about studies that haven't been asked before. Um, so you might find that some more detail than usual is needed to uh, excel in this study. Uh, but we'll find out in May what those questions look like. All right, so let's start with the uh, whole notion of what REM actually is, or what are some of the preconceptions about dreaming and sleep that we have as a pop culture. Um, in 2010, there was a widely successful movie, Christopher Nolan's great film, Inception. Um, of course, that's highly uh, subjective, but I do like this film, even though it may have some inaccuracies uh, that don't gel with what we know about sleeping and dreaming. One of those inaccuracies is that the time we spend dreaming doesn't correspond with the time uh, that we spend in the real world. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character uh, says in the movie that five minutes dreaming in the real world uh, equals an hour in the dream world. And uh, the study by Dementin Kleitman uh, seems to contradict this idea, and we'll get to that later. There are, there are several hypotheses, and one of the hypotheses is that time dreaming uh, is equal to time you perceive in the actual dream. So um, let's first talk about uh, REM in terms of how much we do it. 20% uh, of our night is spent in REM, if we're getting like a regular night's sleep, that is, uh, as adults. So it is a good portion of our time sleeping. So it's rather worth noting uh, what is happening at this point. Of course, rapid eye movement is what it sounds like. It is a time when your eyes are fluttering. They be going uh, horizontally, vertically, darting about. Um, if you look at it like an animal sleeping, you may see your, uh, if you have a dog, you see his, his eyes are closed and the eyelids are somewhat fluttering. Um, he is likely in an REM state. Um, and it's probably the worst time to wake up the dog because he'd be dreaming about you know, chasing a cat and then you wake him up and then you become the cat. So be careful with that. You know, let sleeping dogs lie is an expression that exists for a reason. Uh, when we're babies, however, we spend a lot of time in REM. This is just some background. You don't need to know this for the study, but I think it's interesting because why do babies have more dreams than we do as adults? One theory is that because there's so much to process, there's so much that's new to them, they need to sort of configure all the data and make sense of their new sensations in life. Um, but that's, that's a whole speculation. Um, it's all theoretical. So let's look at a typical scale or, or, or a breakdown of what a typical night of sleep might look like. You know, about 100 years ago, we would never think that sleep is so diverse in, in, in what's happening in, inside your, your head. Um, but EEG machines have shown that there are several um, phases of sleep. Um, actually, you could say there are five stages of sleep, um, with REM being the fifth one, uh, depending on um, how deep you are. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper, meaning that your brain waves slow down as time goes on. And uh, these are the sample brain waves that represent most of us as we sleep. Um, beta waves and alpha waves are actually waking states. So those first two images there are wakefulness. Now, alpha is much slower. Um, it tends to be more like a meditative state, um, that sort of state right on the cusp of sleep. You're not quite sleeping just yet. And uh, for those people who take AP psychology, they had to memorize all of these different uh, brain waves. I think for our purposes, we don't have to worry too much about this, uh, but it's nice to know more than what the syllabus requires you to know. So your brain is slowing down, your electrical impulses for brain activity is, is getting more um, relaxed. Um, but what's weird about sleep is that it sort of picks you back up into almost a wakeful state, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So REM brainwaves do not look like deep sleep brainwaves that are delta waves. Um, if you ever want to memorize the various brainwaves involved in um, wakefulness to, to depth of sleep, you could think of the acronym BAVES. Uh, this is an acronym I created. 
um, just stands for beta, alpha, theta, and delta, um, corresponding respectively with the um, images on the left. Okay, uh, as we said earlier, uh, REM is the one stage of sleep that we're going to concentrate on mostly for this study, uh, though the participants will be woken up in both REM and non-REM sleep. And again, it stands for rapid eye movement. Please recognize that acronym. Um, REM is also known as paradoxical sleep. This you should know. Um, a paradox is something that seems like it should not exist, but yet it does exist. And let's just try to explain real quick why REM uh, seems to be a paradox of activity versus inactivity in the body. So it's a high state of activity in the brain, but a low state of activity in the body. And you know, the uh, volunteer, uh, voluntary uh, nervous system doesn't quite work. You can't act out your dreams, uh, though it seems like your brain is quite alert and awake. All right, so a paradox, is, again, is something that is sort of contradictory, yet it still exists. So paradoxical sleep is called paradoxical sleep because, again, it seems like you should be awake. Um, you see there are some examples of a brainwave uh, for a person who's awake, then you see it slow down for non-REM sleep. And then when you go to REM, look how similar that looks to wakeful states. It's sort of like a combination between um, beta and alpha waves. Uh, prior to this study, uh, there was a suspicion that REM did correspond with dreaming, that this was the part of the night where you're actually dreaming. Um, and why do we know this? We know this because of a guy named Azarinsky, uh, Eugene Azarinsky. He was, uh, it's claimed that he was trying to figure out if his old uh, EEG machine was working or not working, and he used his son as a test subject, and he was working late into the night, and he discovered that his son, uh, son's eyes were darting about as he was sitting in the EEG machine, and he was thinking, you know, is this broken? Is this machine broken? And, you know, as he, as he tried to replicate this more and more, he realized that it wasn't the machine, it was the actual person that we have eye movements as we sleep. So just like many scientific discoveries that were sort of groundbreaking, um, it starts off with sort of an accidental discovery. You know, think um, the discovery of penicillin or things like that. Um, who was that guy? Uh, Alexander Fleming with the Petri dish, uh, accidentally discovering, you know, growth uh, equals penicillin, all that stuff like that. So anyway, that's a little bit of the, of the background. Um, you can get more into the background uh, by looking at the primary source. Um, key thing to note though is that what makes this study different from previous studies is that it's going to use equipment uh, where a lot of the previous research was somewhat more subjective. So uh, it even uses the word subjective. This knowledge that REM corresponds with dreaming uh, depended on subjective report of the dreamer and uh, therefore it's not terribly reliable. Um, but there, there is, they're going into this knowing that they're probably going to find something uh, with their EEG machine. And uh, Azarinsky did work with Kleitman, and then Kleitman later worked with Dement. And uh, William Dement, by the way, is, uh, was really a great advocate for sleep awareness, uh, knowing what's happening while you sleep and the importance of sleep, especially for young people who uh, maybe devalue sleep because they're prioritized their lives to party rather than get the full, you know, seven to eight hours that is usually recommended. So he was a big proponent of teaching people um, the intricacies of sleep. Um, you know, sleep is super important. It helps us with memory. It helps us consolidate the information that we gathered that day uh, and stuff like that. So anyway, um, just a little bit of the background. Let's get more into the procedure of the study or the hypotheses. There are three hypotheses. Uh, we might as well, rather than just finding out if REM correlates with dreaming, since we're doing this study, or since the and climate are doing the study, they might as well look at some other phenomenon related to sleep or REM. So for example, um, what we talked about with the movie Inception, does the length of the time in REM correspond or, or, or have a link with the time you estimated your dream was? So if you spent five minutes in, in the dream world, did you actually enter REM for uh, five minutes or about five minutes? And the third hypothesis I think is sort of interesting is uh, do these eye movements, are they random uh, or are they actually related to the content of your dream? So for example, if I'm dreaming about activity that is horizontal, are my eyes going to go left and right? And uh, spoiler alert, the, the answer is, is likely yes. All right. Um, 
it's a lab study, so we have to have some uh, controlled apparatus. And uh, we do this in a sleep lab. And sleep labs are more and more popular today than they were in the 1950s. I mean, I think the whole notion of a sleep lab in the 50s was somewhat unusual. Uh, now, I think a lot of people go to sleep labs, especially uh, as we, I think as, as people get more and more obese in society, they tend to have more uh, sleep disruption, like things like uh, sleep apnea uh, and, and stuff like that. So I know I was in a sleep lab about what, 15 years ago, super awkward. And I could only imagine how awkward it was for these people to be hooked up to these electrodes uh, as they sleep. Uh, this is a modern picture. Don't use this picture as a, a point of reference for what happened in the 50s. Um, the EEG machine was much older looking. It's something more like this, uh, done with uh, paper uh, rather than computer readout. Uh, as I said, I'll give it a little bit more detail than maybe is necessary because, again, we don't know what kind of things could be asked. But I think it's interesting that um, the EEG machine was uh, set to different speeds depending on what it was measuring. Now, it's a little bit confusing for some students. The EEG machine and the EOG machine are actually the same machine, uh, just with the electrodes hooked up to a different place. And um, let me explain that a little bit later. Um, the EEG machine is measuring... Uh, uh, actually, I'll explain it now. The EEG, e, yeah, EEG machine is measuring uh, your brain activity, the electrical activity in your brain. And if you want to know what it stands for, it's an electroencephalograph. Uh, luckily, I think you can just use EEG. I'm sure a lot of students don't want to write that word electroencephalograph on their test papers, but you could. Uh, EOG is an electrooculograph. Um, and what does that mean? It just means it's measuring the muscles around the eye. Uh, and the paper speeds are different. Now, why are they different? Um, brain waves are much more nuanced uh, and much faster. Um, and we need to be able to distinguish between beta, alpha, theta, and delta, and all that stuff like that. So we're going to use a faster paper speed. And the faster the paper speed, uh, the higher detail we're going to get in the readout. Um, this might be a very old uh, analogy, but I'll use it anyway. Uh, when you record things on a VCR tape, if you record it at a higher speed, the quality is actually going to go up. You'll use more of the tape, but you'll have more crisp images on that VCR tape. It's sort of like the same thing here. The faster the paper speed, the, the, the better the quality of detail is. For the EOG, which is measuring um, eye, eye muscle activity around, around the eyes, you don't need that level of detail. You just need to know, are you moving or are you not moving your eyes? So we're going to slow that paper down, save some paper. Um, so that's going to be three millimeters per second, whereas the EEG is three centimeters per second. Now, if they ever ask you, what are some of the controls of the dementin kleitman study? That's a control. Um, it'll stay the same for most participants, especially the EEG. The EEG will always be three centimeters per second. I believe the EOG, sometimes it was three millimeters, sometimes it was six millimeters. Okay, but that is definitely control. So like I said, the biggest difference between the EEG and the EOG is not so much the machine itself, but the speed of the paper and where the electrodes are being hooked up to. So two or three electrodes will be pasted to the scalp and exactly, um, oh, I don't want to say exactly, I think it says two or more electrodes by the eye. Now, the electrodes, how, how do you uh, translate those waves into meaning? Um, using this borrowed image, I believe this is from maybe the Myers AP textbook, um, you could tell left versus right eye movement because they'll be sort of mirror images of each other. Okay, another apparatus was a bell to wake up the participants. Now, when you say bell, make sure that you recognize that it's not, you know, not, someone's not clanging a bell, walking in the room like that. It's actually a person who is away from the sleeper, pushing a, a, a button or some sort of automated bell that's electronic or electric, excuse me. So electric bell is a, is a good way to uh, say that this study was also controlled by the way the participants were woken up. You know, can, you could imagine if a scientist just came in and shook them or made a loud noise or rang a, a manual bell that that would be a less controlled procedure. That would be uh, another variable that you're not controlling. So we're always making sure that the participants are woken up in the same manner. Okay, uh, another apparatus would be the tape recorder that was used to uh, have the participants uh, speak into if they recorded having a dream. 
So um, not used for every awakening, only if they said yes to if you were uh, dreaming or not, they would then proceed to record what the content of the dream actually was. Okay. Um, just note here, this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but of the 152 dreams recalled, 26 were not included because of poor recording, uh, which did not allow for complete transcription. So it was in, imperfect, uh, the, you know, relatively uh, imperfect compared to today's ways of recording audio. So it wasn't always crystal clear. We don't know if that was due to participant error, experimenter error, or equipment failure. All right, but it was an old school tape recorder. All right, so who are these participants? Uh, they are mostly, uh, as you would expect at, at the time, in the 1950s, mostly men with only two women. And um, if four eventually exercised their right to withdraw, maybe they were just like, this is way too much. I want to go home and sleep in my own bed. Um, so only five of them spent a substantial amount of time in the sleep lab. And uh, I think the longest was 17 nights. And they were told when they came to make sure that, that they had not recently had any uh, caffeine or alcohol. Uh, and this is also a control. Um, I, when I taught in China, I would always have a problem with my students. Uh, it might be a language thing. They would say they couldn't drink wine or coffee. Um, but wine and coffee is too narrow. Uh, there are other types of uh, alcohol besides wine. I think it's just a translation issue. And there's other types of caffeine besides coffee. There's tea, there's uh, you know, Coca-Cola. And things like that. So we don't want to have any sort of, um, you know, outside influence uh, affecting their sleep cycles. And sure enough, you know, it is shown that these two things uh, could wreak havoc on your sleep. You know, you might sleep nine hours after a, a binge of, of, of drinking, uh, but it's probably not going to be the quality or the depth that you would like. So uh, I've heard that even REM is shortened substantially if you are drunk while sleeping. Um, so, you know, don't drink too much. Another control is they were told to come shortly before their normal sleeping time. So they didn't want to force people to sleep at times where they would not normally sleep. So um, they made sure that that was also controlled, that it wasn't just them, you know, waiting for tiredness to take over. Uh, come at your normal sleeping time or prior to your normal sleeping time. Uh, when they get there, the electrodes are then connected to their scalp and their ocular region. And uh, the experimenter would observe the EEG record to note when they entered REM. And when that period ends, the bell would be used to wake up the subject. Now, the thing is, if the dream was recall recalled, then it was spoken into the tape recorder. Like I said earlier, if there was no dream, there's no need to record anything uh, because there's nothing to talk about. And this was also done for NREM or non-REM as a contrast. And this was also done at different time intervals for REM. So remember the uh, what is it, the second hypothesis that the time would correspond with uh, the time in the dream world as they were in the REM state. So that's to test if dream length equals REM length. All right. So those two uh, conditions for that IV were five versus 15 minutes. Um, they didn't want to mess around with too many uh, intervals between them because, you know, then it gets all messy. So you have these very two clean, neat IVs for a length of, of sleep. Uh, I'm sorry, length of REM, not sleep. So five-minute REM versus 15-minute REM, and they would see uh, if their estimation would be within the ballpark of those two um, IVs. And they were only given those two choices. They weren't given like seven and a half or ten or anything like that. And uh, again, if they did have a dream, they did record the content. And I think the two most uh, easily remembered things for um, the content of the dream, or my favorite, is the two people who are seen throwing tomatoes at each other. And the recorded or the observed REM was from left to right. Or the impulses showed horizontal eye movement for watching two people throw tomatoes at each other. And conversely, for the vertical eye movement, one of the dreams was uh, seeing people uh, hoisted up or climbing up a cliff. Uh, there were other dreams. Uh, I believe there was one of people playing basketball, um, or there was one of someone driving, which was not very horizontal or vertical. It was sort of like a central or, or more centered movement, uh, because I guess when you're driving, you're seeing things from a first person point of view, and you can't quite you know, take your eyes off the road. 
Um, but I think, again, these two um, dreams are easy to remember. People throwing tomatoes and people watching people climbing cliffs or seeing people hoisted up a cliff. All right, so just to review real quick, hypothesis one is, is there a connection between REM and dreaming? And the DV or the, 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 re, the recorded response would be, yes, I was dreaming or no, I wasn't dreaming, which is somewhat subjective. But again, we have an EEG there to give this a little bit of scientific credibility. Hypothesis two, will there be a correlation between the length of the REM state and the length of the dreams? And that is recorded through uh, five or 15. And the last one, is there a connection between eye movement and dream of content? And that's more of a, a qualitative type of uh, data. So again, the first one is yes or no. The second one is five or 15. And the third one is more about the anecdotal uh, information given by the participants. So let's get into some of those results to see how all three of these hypotheses were proven to be true. Again, a spoiler, but you know, if it wasn't proven to be true, it probably wouldn't be in the textbook. So uh, I think with all the studies we've looked at, or most of the studies we've looked at, the hypothesis tend to be true. So I'm not spoiling too much here. All right, results. Hypothesis one is a yes, as we said before. And the numbers seem to be uh, quite conclusive without even running any sort of um, probability numbers or p-values and things like that. Um, it seems like this is definitely correlated. Uh, so people, again, were woken up in REM and NREM or non-REM. And look at those numbers, especially for no REM. This is such a dramatic uh, difference. All right? Some of these people recorded no dream recall at all when there's no eye movement happening. Those last four people, at least, did not recall a single dream. Um, sort of a side note here, if you ever talk to somebody and they said, I didn't dream last night, they're probably, um, they're not lying, but they're just not remembering well. And one of the reasons why they're not remembering well is they probably slept pretty well and they weren't woken up in an REM sleep. Um, we have alarm clocks that wake us up and they don't care about what stage of sleep you're in. Uh, nowadays with like iPhones and apps, you could actually buy an app that wakes you up uh, based on where you are in the sleep cycle. So you're not you know, disrupted uh, from a dream. Uh, if you're disrupted from a dream uh, in the morning, it probably meant that you didn't come fully out of, of, of the cycle. Um, you didn't return back to like a delta state. So that being said, um, your quality of sleep is sometimes dependent on when you're woken up. I'm getting all, way off the topic here, but let's go back to this uh, little graphic of information. Um, there's one participant here, I believe. Yeah, I'll just click onto the next thing. Yeah, WD. Uh, we don't, um, by the way, these, these participants, they're used, uh, their initials only. So there is confidentiality here. Um, this is a common practice. If you don't want to reveal the name and you shouldn't reveal the name of your participants, uh, you just use their initials, um, WD. Ironically, that's actually the initials of one of the uh, people in the study, William DeMent, but I don't think he was actually in the sleep lab. So it's not William DeMent. So let's call him, uh, Wally Doppelganger uh, or whatever. Uh, whoever WD is, he's interesting because he was told the wrong information on purpose. Uh, let me just read this verbatim. WD was told he would be awakened only when the recording indicated that he was dreaming. But REM and NREM awakenings were then interspersed randomly. So this is kind of cool um, that they're doing this because they don't have to do this, but this is a way to make sure that there's no sort of demand characteristics. If we say we're only gonna wake you up when you're dreaming, then you'll be more pressured to perhaps report a dream even if there wasn't. And interestingly enough, uh, regardless of when we woke him up, despite the wrong information, he only had one dream recalled in non-REM and 34 uh, instances of no recall. So out of the 35 awakenings, 34 of them were I did not have a dream. So uh, this is well done to, again, control for some sort of demand characteristic. Okay, so pr maybe a little bit more information than you want, uh, but you know it, it, it's something that was done to make sure there was no sort of demand characteristics. I can't say that enough. Um, I don't think they've ever asked about WD, but I've seen some really you know detailed questions in the past couple of years. So it doesn't hurt to know about him or her. I'm guessing it's a him. Yeah, it's a him because it says WD was told he. Okay, it's a him. All right, so um, it's not also due to practice effects. So hypothesis one is not due to just being exposed to the conditions more and more and more. 
Um, so what they did was they compared the results uh, for the first half of sessions with the second half of sessions. And with maybe one exception, um, this DN person, most of them uh, follow a very similar path. Uh, so IR 12 versus 5 in the first half, 14 versus 3 in the second half. So very similar ratios, but this DN character kind of messes that up a little bit. All right, so that's hypothesis one. That's a definite yes. All right, REM does correspond with dreaming states. Hypothesis two is also a yes. All right, um, they were pretty on the money most of the time. I mean, look at those totals. It's pretty conclusive that um, the time in REM equals the time estimated in the dream. So if I was having a dream that I was throw, I saw people throwing tomatoes at each other for five minutes, I was woken up, uh, and they, you know the guy sees I, I was in REM for five minutes, I would say, um, you know, I guess that dream was about five minutes. All right. So usually they were right on the money with that. With, I think, no exceptions, the ratio is in favor of the time being accurate to the REM state. And I kind of ruined hypothesis three before. Um, when we talked about those two dreams of people throwing tomatoes and people climbing cliffs. All right, uh, there was more data gathered. Uh, might as well, right? We're doing the study, so why not gather things beyond the, the three hypotheses that we had? Uh, so table five of the original uh, source material looks at um, the number of words that was used um, in the dream narratives. And uh, that R over there is a symbolic representation of the correlation between the duration of REM and the number of words uh, used in the microphone or in the tape recorder. Um, so it seems to suggest that the longer you dream, the more uh, description you have um, of that dream. Okay, so that's just some extra uh, data. Uh, it rarely gets talked about, um, but it's there, so we might as well just put it on the graphic here. Okay, I also just want to include a sort of general discussion about what the difference is between a result and a conclusion, because I, I've discovered that a lot of students have a hard time with questions that ask them, what is the result of the study versus what is a conclusion of the study? There's a very easy way to handle this, and I'll just kind of go off script a little bit, um, or at least off the REM subject for a little bit, just to make sure that we understand the difference between a result and a conclusion. It's actually not as difficult as you may think. I'm going to give you three examples. Let's start with the statement, I scored 68% on my last uh, ACE exam or my last CIE exam, um, which is actually a really good score for a Cambridge-based uh, exam, um, despite you know Americans thinking that's pretty low. That's like a B, for, uh, maybe an A, depending on what year it is. Uh, a conclusion there would probably be something like, um, I am quite smart, or I am a good test taker, or I study well. Um, the I scored a 68% is a detail, is a numeric detail. And the results are often numeric details uh, if it's quantitatively gathered um, um, data. Um, so, and a conclusion is something that will perhaps always be true. Uh, let me use this one as an example. I gained three pounds after Thanksgiving. Conclusion, um, holidays are fattening or can be fattening. Uh, my girlfriend has stopped talking to me. Conclusion, um, she does not like me. Uh, there's a difference in tense. Results are often what happened. Conclusions are what it means. So let me use Dement and Kleitman. Let's get back to Dement and Kleitman again to get into this. Um, this is a past paper question. Describe the content uh, of a dream for one participant. Those are results. Um, and you should use the past tense for results. All right, so in this case, one participant dreamed about two, people's, uh, two people throwing tomatoes towards each other. Now the second one, what did Dement and Kleitman conclude about the relationship between dream content and eye movements? This is not results, this is not data, this is something that will perhaps always be true. So here you want to use the present tense. So one more time, for the first one I'm going to use past tense. One participant dreamed about people being hoisted up a cliff or climbing up a cliff. Past tense, what did the Dement and Kleitman conclude? that dream content corresponds with the direction of eye movements. All right, you see that difference. It's a subtle difference, but I can't say it enough because so many students are confusing uh, conclusions with results. All right, so I just wanted to take a moment to clarify that. All right, moving forward, uh, the last part of any study will be the evaluation. Um, let me just pop them all up here 
right now. Um, you might disagree with where my arrows are, but I actually think the generalizability of this study is somewhat high. Now you're saying to yourself, but there were only nine people, only two females, and uh, several of them left the study earlier than expected. So how could five people be high in generalizability? Well, it's always true with studies that are physiological or biological that, or it's usually true, that we have the same basic core mechanisms in our brain and our bodies. Uh, we all have hearts, we all have um, ears, um, you know, hopefully. So when it comes to biological processes, you know, race and perhaps gender don't matter as much um, as it would maybe for things that are like in social psychology or um, you know, maybe even cognitive. So that being said, you're allowed to say the study is somewhat highly generalizable because it's a biological process. Everyone sleeps. Uh, everyone sleeps in stages, I hope. So um, that's a little bit of a surprise. That's why I'm highlighting the G on the GRAV G-R-A-V-E evaluation um, mnemonic. Now, if you've never seen this before, again, uh, G is generalizability, R is reliability, A is application, V is validity, and E is ethics. All right, so moving forward, reliability uh, is somewhat high, uh, or I actually put it very high. I guess I'm thinking about those various controls. Remember some of the controls were things like the apparatus, uh, the paper speed, um, the way to wake them up, the procedures, etc. Uh, controlling for alcohol and caffeine. Uh, one control I, I did not mention earlier was uh, the way the electrodes were gathered. Um, when the person went to the sleep lab, the electrodes were gathered in a ponytail, and that's actually a, a word that's used in the primary source. So to make sure that the electrodes were not disrupting sleep too much, all those wires were gathered in the back of the head in a ponytail fashion. Um, application now remember, at the time, this this was this was news. Uh, people thought sleep was like a solid state of existence. They didn't realize, as we do today, uh, how nuanced sleep can be. So nowadays, uh, sleep labs are a common occurrence. They're common. They're commonly used. Um, so knowing when your patient is in a depth, uh, a deep state, versus a shallow state of sleep might be important for what you're researching. So it's very uh, important for research. And like I said earlier, there, there, there have been apps that, that, that look at um, your brain waves to give you a better quality of sleep. Okay, um, validity. Okay, validity is the lowest of all these uh, five dimensions because it is in a lab and that's an, you know, an easy way to look at any sort of lab study. Um, of course, if they ask you about this, uh, don't just say it's low because it's a lab or it's medium because it's a lab. Uh, give some details. So it's not natural for people to show up uh, into a stranger's bed and put on electrodes on their scalp. You could say that the electrodes themselves are disruptive to the sleep. Even if you put them in a ponytail, it's unnatural. You have to go through this whole procedure to get them on your face. Um, Sleeping with anything on your face is unusual. I, I, you know, I've tried to use like blackout um, blindfolds while I'm on sleeping on airplanes, and I just so conscious of the fact they're on my face, it, it interrupts my my sleep. So, validity is the, the weakest link of of these five. Uh, ethics is quite good. Uh, we talked about W D being lied to. We told you that um, he would be woken only during REM states, even though he was woken in both NREM and REM. That is not a terrible deception. It's not going to be a psychologically traumatizing deception. Um, but most of the people in the study knew what they were getting into. So there's really not a lot of deception. Um, you know, they volunteered. So it's not going to be a problem to force them to go into the sleep lab. They all had the right to withdraw. And uh, four of them did uh, withdraw. So this is quite an ethical study. One of the most ethical studies that we've looked at all year. So how could we improve the study? Um, here's an old question from some textbook, and I forgive me for not remembering which one it is. I believe this is from two syllabi, syllabi ago. Uh, suggest how this study could be improved. All right, it's an eight-point question. And uh, just to give you the cheat here, um, we're going to look at the marking scheme for that question. So one change we could make is to have a larger sample of participants. And... Um, you know, we said earlier that generalizability is not terrible because it's biological, but it would help if we had more people in the study. Um, the change that I like would be to try to do this in maybe a more natural setting, uh, maybe make this a field experiment or have it so they're in their own beds. So it could be in the participant's home. 
And you know, one idea that I had is perhaps why even use the EEG? Um, can you do this um, with a couple? Uh, this is going to be a really awkward uh, thing to do with your wife or husband, but could the wife or husband stare at your face and see when your eyes are moving to remove that sort of unnatural situation of having electrodes hooked up to your head? All right, so it's not a difficult question. Increase the people, increase the ecological validity, and give some details, and you're done. All right, guys, so that was the, the menten Kleitman study. Um, like I said earlier, it's been uh, on the Cambridge syllabus for many, many, many years. So if this video was not in-depth enough, I encourage you to go to the primary source. It's actually a very graspable primary source uh, reading. So find the PDF file and read away. It's, it's not as hard to get through as something like maybe the uh, Yamamoto helping monkeys behavior and stuff like that. All right, I'm talking way too much. Uh, have a good day. Enjoy.